Well, thank you and good afternoon. I'd like to add my thanks to the coordinators. Oh, wait, I'm one of them. So I got to choose this topic. I think it's uh, kind of interesting. What Dave Bruning forgot to mention about our flight was that we went from minus three to 83, which is an 86 degree differential within the space of about three hours. So I'm really thankful there's no jumbotron with me on it because I don't feel particularly glamorous right now. So, mimics of IBD. And, all right, so when I was thinking about this, I had to think about whether I was gonna talk about mimics of IBD in a patient who doesn't have IBD but has something else, or does a patient have IBD and then something else is going on as well? So I'm gonna present some cases of both of those scenarios. And then I had to think about, well, how am I gonna talk about this? Are they mimics based on location of the disease or the pathology? Is it based on symptoms, which would also include extraintestinal manifestations of IBD? The endoscopic appearance, and, and obviously my colleagues have already done a really nice job of that, and, and Dr. Bruning just talked about radiographic appearance. So I'm gonna show you some examples of some cases that, that include all of these different things. I think this is probably the number one mimic of IBD. So the SGA diagnostic test, which keeps me in business, uh, this is a test that has come back on a young woman who has diarrhea and abdominal pain and has been on two anti-TNFs and in a study, and her diagnosis was based on a positive SGI diagnostic test, not based on pathology from uh, her colon or her small intestine. So just for those of you who aren't sure what SGI stands for, it's serology, genetics, and inflammation. There, are, there, there is room for, for these tests, and I think that going back to the beginning of the story with our ASCA and our P-ANCA and our OMPC, which are not proprietary markers, and you can get from Quest, you can get from Mayo, you can get from commercial labs, actually can be helpful once in a while, but again, you have to remember that they're no better than coin flip. So be mindful of why you're ordering these, and it's not to make the diagnosis. All right, so if we start at the top of the GI tract, so in patients who may have dysphagia or ulcerations in their esophagus, and they're of the right age group, you're gonna think about Crohn's, and that age group is gonna be under 25, usually. But think about HSV as giving you those ulcerations that you may think are Crohn's. HIV ulcers, so the uh, acute presentation of HIV disease can be dysphagia and esophageal ulcers. We don't see that much of it anymore, but certainly it's out there. And then, you know, probably the most common is the pill esophagitis. The patient has forgotten that they took a course of doxycycline because, well, it was just an antibiotic for their bronchitis or their sinusitis, and now they have dysphagia. All right, so if we move down the GI tract, here is an example of a, a video capsule photo. And I show this to the fellows and I say, what's the diagnosis? Well, they know I'm an ibd -er, so they all say, well, this is Crohn's of the small bowel. But I haven't given you a story. So one of the takeaway points here is that you have to have the right clinical context and the right clinical story before you make a diagnosis of Crohn's disease. So if I told you this was a 22-year-old woman with diarrhea and abdominal pain and weight loss and fevers, okay, so this could be Crohn's, but there's still other things in her differential. If I told you this was a 78-year-old gentleman with abdominal pain and weight loss and night sweats, that maybe Crohn's wouldn't be so high on your differential. So just be careful what you ask for because you just may get it and not know what to do with this. So it turns out that this is Crohn's, but again, it's in the right context that I took this picture and, and show this slide. All right, so here are some mimics of cases that have come across my clinic. So this is a, a woman who was diagnosed with Crohn's disease of the colon, and here is a sample picture of her very first colonoscopy that she had done by the referring physician, and she, she clearly has some ulcerations here in the right colon, and so she got diagnosed with Crohn's disease, put on prednisone. It made her fat and uh, unhappy, and she didn't get better from her pain or her bleeding. So we asked, for the we asked for the slides, and it turns out that this is pure ischemia 
not ischemic change associated with Crohn's disease or with any kind of anastomosis. This was pure ischemia. And oh yeah, going back to talk to her, she didn't, she didn't tell anybody that she had just started a high dose of, of estrogen therapy uh, for, for birth control and for uh, menstrual ablation and because she didn't think of that as particularly important to a gastroenterologist. And so this was right-sided ischemia due to uh, hormone therapy, not Crohn's disease. That's why she didn't get better with 40 milligrams of prednisone. All right, here's another case. This was a young gentleman who presented to the ER with right-sided abdominal pain and some hematochesia. Not so much diarrhea, but hematochesia, and you can see here that uh, his, you know, he's not that he's not that fat. So he's like, yeah, well, maybe I've lost some weight because I don't want to eat because I get these episodes of abdominal pain. And he, and here is a a representative slide of his CT that was done, and he was referred to treat Crohn's disease after he didn't get better on 40 milligrams of prednisone. And it turns out that you know he brought these these uh, the CT with him and we had it read by our radiologists, and I get a call, and they're like, well, Susie, this isn't Crohn's. This is a Meckel's diverticulum that's inflamed. This guy just needs an operation, and he's gonna be much better. So that's what this is. So right-sided, colonic, and uh, small bowel, well, this isn't actually colonic, it's actually small bowel terminal ileal thickening in a young gentleman isn't always, who has hematochesia, isn't necessarily going to be Crohn's. This was Meckel's. All right, so here is the MRE of a woman with erythema nodosum, and she has abdominal pain. And this is a representative picture of her MRE, and there's no telltale arrow here for where the lesion is. And why is that? Because it's completely normal. So just like Dave Bruning said, you know, you have to be mindful of who you are scanning. And this was actually her third MRE done by a third uh, institution because she absolutely had erythema nodosum that got better with prednisone, but she continued to have abdominal pain and they were convinced that she actually had Crohn's disease. We just kept missing it. And after three negative MREs, I put her on a tincture of amitriptyline and she did much better. All right, so small bowel mimics of Crohn's disease. So you have to think about infection, and, and Gary told us about the infection for colons, and, uh, and so you absolutely you still have to think about that person and where they're coming from. And so uh, those from the Far East, you still have to think about TB. And don't forget about Yersinia. So Yersinia in a young patient who comes with acute diarrhea and some arthralgias and some thickening of that small bowel, particularly the terminal ileum, that still could be Yersinia. So make sure that you know that their diarrhea has been going on for longer than six weeks, not just three or four days. Neoplasm, you always have to consider uh, neoplasm uh, in a patient who may be even a little bit older. Uh, medications, so NSAIDs we're always thinking about, but now actually we're going to hear from our colleague Joe Murray in a little bit, and he actually was the one that was able to describe very nicely the enteritis that you get from being on SARBs, and now that's a black box warning, and so make sure that you're, you know which antihypertensives your patient is on. Celiac disease is probably the, one of the great mimickers. And then there's this horrible autoimmune enteritis NOS, where your pathologist says, well, it's inflamed chronically, but I don't think this is Crohn's. I'm not sure what it is. But it's this autoimmune enteritis, which is somewhere between celiac and Crohn's, but not quite either one of them. We've already uh, talked about Meckel's diverticulum a little bit. And then for, for women, don't forget about the, the gynecologic things that you may see and endometriosis is high up on that list. So if we move down into the colon, some mimickers of IBD is the normal colon. So you get, you know, the patient has diarrhea and or abdominal pain, and the pathologist tells you that it's nonspecific chronic inflammation, but the crypt architecture is not distorted. There is plenty of mucus in there. There's no basal cell plasmacytosis. That's normal, folks. You're supposed to have a little bit of inflammation in your colon, otherwise it can't tell friend from foe. The PrEP can actually affect the way that uh, you will see things histologically, and, a, and a patholo an expert pathologist will tell you that there's PrEP effect there and that's not true inflammation. 
Gary showed us a strongyloides colitis. I've, I have to admit I've never seen one of those. He showed us a nice table of different infections that can mimic IBD. And I just list probably the top three that we should be thinking about, which is histoplasmosis, CMV, and C. diff. The neoplasms, and you don't see Car Kaposi sarcoma so much in the era, in the era now of all of the uh, antiretroviral therapies for HIV, but I have been fooled by a sarcoma that looked very like ugly Crohn's disease. And then leukemic infiltrate can actually look like ulcerative colitis. The solitary rectal ulcer syndrome, perfect name for a condition that doesn't have to be solitary in the rectum or an ulcer but uh, can look like erythema in the sigmoid or a deep ulcer sort of in that rectosigmoid area. This is gonna be seen more in women who are complaining of constipation and straining, and this is prolapse, and your pathologist will do a, can give you a very nice description of this thickened uh, uh, collagen band that that makes that diagnosis. But a lot of women get treated for proctitis before they ever get the correct diagnosis. Ipilimumab, which is a monoclonal antibody used to treat certain kinds of urological cancers, can cause a very significant, uh, impressive colitis where patients are admitted because of dehydration and volume depletion from horrible, horrible diarrhea, and it's caused by ipilimumab. And actually, we actually have a protocol now um, um, at Mayo put together by the urologists and the uh, oncologists because this was so common. And then the, the segmental colitis associated with diverticular disease. So these are the patients who are a little older, they have diverticular disease, their rectum is normal, all of the inflammation is associated in the sigmoid along with those uh, diverticular orifices, and that they behave like IBD. You may want to treat them with mesalamine, but it's not true IBD. So what can occur in either location? So there's the small bowel, the colon, either one can be radiation change. So radiation enteritis or colitis can appear 25 years later. So the, the, the patient who had a Wilms tumor when they were three and they're now 30 and presenting with small bowel obstruction, that you've got to make sure that you asked about those, about what they got treated with for that cancer in their childhood. Again, neoplasm irritable bowel syndrome, Bichette's can be in either the small bowel or the large bowel, and then again, ischemia can be either place. So perianal mimics, so not Crohn's, not everything that fistulizes is Crohn's disease. Don't forget to ask about, in women, any obstetric history. So if they had five children and that, all of, that with every one they tore and that there wasn't a, a, a gynecologist or obstetrician around to maybe repair that and they had midwives that, that they've scarred down and that they may have uh, some perianal problems. Or previous GI surgery, so a hemorrhoidectomy may have gone bad. Infection. So the worst perianal disease I ever saw was in a Filipino nurse, and he was transferred for treatment of Crohn's disease, and he actually had a, a pelvis full of TB, and that's what was causing his fistulas. Um, and don't forget about LGV, so there are other non-bacterial uh, non infections that can cause fistulas as well. Ischemia, why would you have ischemia to the perianal region? Probably because of previous GI surgery. Um, but also neoplasm can do that as well. So, okay, so now for the last few slides here, I'm going to show you a few cases of people who actually did have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis but had something else going on. So mimics of their IBD but something, something that was more sinister. So here's a patient who has a known history of Crohn's disease, presents with small bowel obstruction, and gets, gets hospitalized and put on IV steroids and does better, discharged. Comes back two weeks later, same story. Gets put on infliximab in the hospital, gets better, goes home. This is now his third obstruction in two months, and it turns out that we sent him to the OR, and what he actually had was a, 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 fi, a, a fibrotic stricture from, long, from lymphoma. So here we were treating Crohn's, and it wasn't Crohn's at all. This was uh, a cancer, and we were just helping it along with anti-TNFs. 
So here is a patient who has known Crohn's disease, and there are two shots here from the representative imaging and the, and the arrows that you can see here. Well, it's kind of hard to see because they're sort of squashed down. But here is the, the small intestine, and then there's a bright hoo-ha thingy sitting here, and here it is over here in the small intestine. This is a patient with known Crohn's and continuous abdominal pain and uh, uh, now starting to have some weight loss. And this is not Crohn's disease. Um, this is actually in hearing the patient's story. Oh yeah, I had something removed from my skin years ago. It was from my scalp, not a big deal. This is actually metastatic recurrent malignant melanoma sitting in his small bowel. So this is a patient with known Crohn's disease, continued weight loss, and fevers. And so got scoped at an outside institution. This is what it looked like. And no biopsies were taken, unfortunately, because they said, well, the patient has Crohn's, so let's give them some prednisone and let's give them an anti-TNF. And the patient got worse and came to see us. And there was, on review of systems, oh, yeah, I've been having a dry cough. Turns out that, that, that when we went back to biopsy this, which goes back to the whole point of, yes, biopsies are very important. Don't just assume that somebody who has IBD, that it's their IBD that's causing the problem. This was histoplasmosis in their colon. And they had it in their lungs, too. That's what the dry cough was. So last point, mimics of IBD. So consider an alternative when high-dose prednisone doesn't work. And that means for either the initial diagnosis or somebody who has IBD and now has other GI symptoms going on that you have to think about either a complication or a concurrent uh, diagnosis. Always think about infection, ischemia, and neoplasm as in your differential for that IBD, because we're internists first and gastroenterologists second. And don't forget that conditions can absolutely overlap, and a patient can have two entities at once. And what's the most common scenario is IBD and overlapping IBS. And so with that, I'm going to stop, and hopefully that gets us pretty much back on time for this session. Thank you very much.